I have the pleasure to provide you with an update on, on MAGIC, where we're standing, some, some about our progress recently, and a little bit about our future plans. Of course, MAGIC is a team. You very well know us all, but um, I'm representing Rupert Manette, programmer for MAGIC, Nick Jarbo, also a programmer. Of course, we have Katy and Lisa as PIs, and then a recent addition to the MAGIC team is Nick Swanson Heisel. Um, at the bottom, you can see a little bit what we are standing for. Of course, we are MAGIC, the Magnetics Information Consortium, which is part of earthref.org, which is the Earth Reference Data and Data Model uh, Umbrella website that is hosting MAGIC. We are going to tell you about something new, and that's actually that actually MAGIC is currently being uh, powered by Fiesta. I will explain what that is. Um, it's a bit on the technical side, but it's an interesting development that's going to allow us to move on from magic into uh, maybe other fields of interest and associated with pale magnet magnetism and rock magnetism. Of course, we're sponsored by NSF for close to two decades now continuously. We're very appreciative of that. And then we got support from our home institutions at OSU and uh, the UCSD. So what I'm going to be talking about, going to Four topics in this talk. I'm going to talk, okay, how will your magnetics results be published as magic data sets? How do we do that? Um, we're going to talk about improvements in the data management efficiencies that we have been implementing over the last couple of years. Um, I'm going to tell you something about how we make magic contributions more fair. Fair is a principle that I will explain to you in, 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 in a minute. It's a very important principle in cyber infrastructure and the running of data repositories. And I'm going to look a little bit to the future and how we can scale up magic for more data and more persistent archiving. So first about your magic results and how that actually is being handled in our magic database online. So a few highlights, just magic in a nutshell. We began in 2002, our first proposal NSF was written and we had our first workshop at Scripps. MAGIC is a sample-based measurement database, but the most important thing is driven by scientific challenges. I will going to be highlighting a few in a minute. Um, MAGIC maintains virgins an open archive for all published rock and paleomagnetic data. And it supports those grand challenges in science by providing a standard data set. So we're standard, standardizing all the diverse data sets being generated by researchers in the field and we do that by applying a singular data model. And that's quite different from other data repositories where that is not per se the case. But by having a single data model, it allows us actually to compare data from different studies to each other, which is tremendously important in, in forwarding our science in the future. You can see the URL, earthref.org slash magic. That's where we're residing. But most importantly, we are open source. And so actually we are using GitHub to develop Earthref and MAGIC. And then as I said, you know, what is new, MAGIC is currently powered by Earthref's open source Fiesta API. And that's basically the software that's sitting behind it. And that actually, that's the engine of MAGIC online. And you can find it at api.earthref.org. So what are those grand challenges that we are basically using to decide, you know, how we need to run MAGIC what the data model is that is required to go after those grand challenges. I'm just, you know, calling out three out of the six that we're typically going after. So one is on the geomagnetic and tumor history of the earth, very big grand challenge, basically covering the entire earth's history, polar wonder and plumes, you know, plume motion and stuff like that. And for example, understanding interactions between the earth's magnetic field and climate. I'm just putting those three up there as an example because it's important without making a singular data model, going after each of those three grand challenges is going to be pretty impractical. And so you make a standardized model, you make all your data homogeneous that way. And if you do that, you actually can get all the data assembled. You can make a synthesis out of that data. You can compare data. And actually, you can actually move forward to entering those, those challenges. Um, one other thing we all know, each study often uses different methods. And also, actually, they're reporting the results quite differently in journals. So by just compiling the data sets from journals, 
you're not going to get there. You need to go that extra step and translating that into the magic data model to actually being able to start comparing data between different studies. And so without magic, I think we've now seen after 20 years, you know, it allows us to organize the data and without that, uh, addressing any of those and challenges is going to be a long and error prone process. So where are we now with, with, with magic? You know, what do we have in the database? So currently we have more than 4,400 unique publications in our database. That's from 200,000 samples or yeah, from 200,000 samples from 200,000 sites across the world, uh, including about 130,000 experiments, 7 million measurements. And recently we also allow squid kind of uh, data in this as well. So we also have more than 3 billion raster measurements currently residing in the magic database. And all this data has been uploaded, not by us per se, but by 109 contributors from around the world. On the right, you can see, of course, you know, a nice picture of the magic uh, web page. And I presume you have been there. So what we've done over the last year, well, 62 new contributors have been joining magic and started to upload their data. That's more than doubled compared to the year before, which is quite good. Um, 220 publications got uploaded from 50,000 sites, 50,000 experiments, and another 2 million measurements. So really, we can see a huge uptick in the use and the data upload in Magic, which is just a great thing. As I said, we started to use raster measurement, allowing for that in the database. So you can actually upload XPM and squid microscopy experiment, sorry. Um, so that's quite exciting. And you know, there's a lot of data being collected in that particular uh, field. And that's now allowed to be up uploaded into Magic as well and stored there for longevity. Another thing that has been done over the last couple of years, we have launched the Jupyter Hub server that actually is running PMAC Pi online in a persistent workspace. What that means is you don't necessarily have to install PMAC Pi on your own computer. You can go to this online Jupyter Hub, use PMAC Pi there, and actually work with your data within the cloud, basically. Another thing that we have worked on very hard is to actually tag all the data that you're uploading with the appropriate metadata and have that indexed in such a way that other entities online can find the data and know about it. There's this thing called JSON-LD that's just a way of describing your data set. We are adhering to this particular initiative that got um, initiated by EarthCube, which is a US uh, cyber infrastructure initiative under the name GeoCode. The most important thing, if you do that, things like Google dataset will index that, and you can actually find your data set if you use uh, that particular uh, Google search tool. Um, and then, as I said, or when I'm going to talk more about that, we transition to the Fiesta API. That's the engine underneath. And then very recently, just this last month, we also have been upgrading our hardware so here at OSU and CIOs, we purchased a three node server cluster that's going to host Elasticsearch, which is basically the software that's running Magic uh, on a much faster machine with more memory, making Magic even more responsive. Okay, so if, if you've been working with Magic, right, this is a little bit what's behind it. We wanted to really make certain that the, the workflow that you have in your lab and when you're working in your lab and you produce data, you go all the way to publication, right? We want to follow that workflow, allowing you to seamlessly keep your own workflow and at the same time, you know, get your data into magic. And so if you look to this table here, you know, there's basically four columns and going from the left to the right, you know, got your data acquisition on the left, you're in the lab, you're using a magnetometer or, or a query balance, you're generating your data, you store it in your measurement data files. Then of course, everybody will have his favorite software to, pr to reduce that data. This could be pmacpy, could be paleomagnetism.org, anything that's run in Excel or PaleoMac or PuffinPot, whatever you have in your lab. So you do your work there, you do your data reduction and your interpretations, and then you can spit that out in another data format. 
So there's two options that we have here. You could either do that directly in what we call the magic data format. That's simply a uh, simple text file. It's either tab or comma delimited. Or you can put it in an Excel file, for example, or any other uh, comma delimited text file. If you have either of those two things, you can do a next step. You can actually start to put it into the magic database. And there's two ways of doing that. If you have a magic text file in that magic format, you can actually upload it in that green box here that's actually to the Fiesta API. So that's something that can be automated and there's no person is actually needed for that. So actually you can go to the back door in an automated fashion, you can actually get the magic data files straight into the magic database. Or if you don't want to do it, you can go into the magic website and actually upload it yourself. You get an opportunity to actually drop the file in there on the magic uh, page or you basically browse on your hard drive and actually pull up the file that way. If you don't have a magic text format file, you can just actually upload any random Excel file. It will, you can drop that into the magic web page. It will bring you into a wizard that allows you to basically identify what column is what. You're going to put a label on it. This is lat, this is long, this is deck, this is ink. You can translate basically a random Excel file and basically translate it into the magic data model that way. There's some training of that tool there that actually remembers if you have a certain Excel file for a certain format, the next time it actually is easier and it knows about that and you more readily actually can upload your data. The main point here is it follows your workflow and it has a lot of flexibility in the sense of how, what software you use, what data files are actually being created and how you then upload into the magic database. This is a little bit more complicated here at the bottom. It's just to show you what kind of tools are actually available to the scientific researcher, the, the, very, the big horizontal bar here in the middle. On the upper left, you know, it's any kind of software you use to massage your data and to reduce it and make it ready for publication, the PMACPI or any of the other tools I just listed before. Um, but then actually Magic provides some other tools as well. So there's a data model browser that basically you can go in there, you can see what is the magic data format. How did we define it? What units are defined? If it's required, is it optional, what not? Everything is described in there for you. There's a method code browser. Basically any measurement that you make of any protocol you use in the lab has been described in there with a simplified code that basically prescribes what you have been doing to a certain measurement, whether it's a fork, demagnetization, et cetera, et cetera. This controlled vocabulary is there. There's a lot there that's already pre canned that sits, you know, for you ready to be used. And then at the bottom, there's a little bit of process to which you can go when you actually are dealing with data that you want to upload into Magic. You might have maybe data that you produced a couple of years ago in an older, for, older version of the data model of Magic. There's an upgrade tool so that allows you to go from that older version into the latest version of Magic. Then there's an upload tool that allows you to actually put it in there, like that wizard I just talked about you. And there's the private workspace for you there on Magic, and that's the, really the key part. So every time you start to make a contribution, you first contribute in your own private workspace. Nobody can see it except you. You can put and assemble all your data in there until you're ready to actually publish it online. We call that activation, but actually when you hit activate, then it becomes actually available to other researchers. If you're in that private workspace, you can do a few things more. You can also share it. So even if it's still private, you can share it with your colleagues, your coworkers, your students, your lab manager, or you can actually share it with reviewers. If you submitted a paper for publication, it's in the review, you can provide a unique URL that only allows those reviewers to come in and actually look at your data within the Magic database. And of course, as soon as things are activated and are public, then there's the search interface. Another thing that's interesting here is at the very bottom right is we got the PMACPI server. So PMACPI is not only used by researchers to do data reduction and visualization of the data and preparing it for upload. We also use it on Magic Online. We put it on a server here with Magic 
and we're using it actually to generate visualizations um, that we use online. And so far we made more than two and a half million plots uh, that way. And they're basically pre-canned and ready to use or see when you're browsing around on Magic. This is a little bit more complicated or this year at least. Um, it's just basically to tell you that Magic is not standing on its own. And actually over the last 20 years, we've assembled a lot of partners that actually we are working with. And some of it, you know, you not, might not be aware of, some of you are. Uh, first of all, we know there's many other databases around that are storing uh, geomagnetic, paramagnetic and rock magnetic data. We've been setting up lots of work with them. Everything here in the databases box that doesn't have a dash line, we have active collaborations with and have all the data actually also residing in magic and vice versa. So we're sharing data with them. And the ones IRAM and IDP and Pangea, we're currently working with to try to establish a collaboration so we can actually have that data also shared between those different partners. On the very right hand side, there's the metadata box. That's an important one. That's basically all the organizations that we are sharing metadata about your magic contributions with. And it's basically to allow other organizations to know what kind of data we have residing in our database and make your data more accessible and findable. And that's a whole list. I'm not going to go through it. But big point is there are many and all the ones that are actually are critical, we are actually working with. Um, just to call two, two out that are very important, we work with Crossref. So we know if you have a DOI of your publication, you immediately know all your uh, citation information about it. And we know about your paper being out there. And Org ID is another one. We are the first organization in the US to have a contract with Org ID. So you, we basically ask people to sign up with Org ID in Magic. And if they upload the data, it's tied to their Org ID, which means that all data sets are truly very nicely and accurately authenticated with Org IDs, which is a tremendously good use. Okay, so how are we improving data management efficiencies? Well, first of all, and I talked a little bit about this already, you know, we have this data, this singular data model that describes all the paleomagnetic and rock magnetic data that we store in Magic. It's very important. We have basically uh, five main tables, right? Locations, sites, samples, specimens, and measurements. Those are the key tables in which you guys are storing your data. Each table has groups of particular data that, that can be stored. And then each group has columns of data. And here on the right, you can see, you know, some examples of that. The big point is it's tremendously well described. It's versioned. Um, there's validations rules in, in there. So if you have a but let long, you know, we know that you should provide it within a certain range of values. All that kind of stuff is already predefined in this data model and it allows us to validate every upload automatically without a human uh, actually uh, intervening. Another very important thing about Magic is that we version our data sets. Um, and every time we up, you upload a new version of it, it basically gets uh, frozen in a database and it gets assigned a data DOI. Soon as you do that, it's registered again, the it's DOI is assigned to it. From then on, it's a permanent entity in, in the cyber infrastructure and you know around the globe and all the data repositories, it's uniquely defined that way. And that's important. Uh, it's one of the things that's required if you are a fair data repository, which we are by the way. This is by the way, just, just a quick view here of how you can upload your data. I talked to you about this wizard on the image on the left, you simply can drop in one of your Excel files or a magic text file. It gets basically read in, it will try to translate it. It will come up with a table. It will identify columns of data you have. If it doesn't know what kind of field it is, it will um, suggest a field name from the data model or otherwise it asks you to select it. It's a very in, in easy way of doing it, even with unstructured Excel data files. And then, you know, when that's all done and that all looks good, it's validated against the data model, it will get uploaded into your private workspace. 
So here's your private workspace. If you're in there, you can have as many contributions that you're assembling for, for any of the work that you're working on. So, um, you can upload multiple data to it. And at some point when you're ready for publication, right? If you're preparing a paper for publication, you can start to massage it until it's all ready and ready to be uh, validated for a last time and then actually activate it, which means that we make it public for you. Okay, so how do we make magic contributions more fair? Well, we, want, we need to make it more findable. That's what the F stands for in FAIR. And at, I told you already in the beginning, you know, we basically are providing our metadata to many different other uh, entities around online. And we do that you know, by using different standards that are out there. And JSON-LD is a structured metadata standard that we're using. It came out of uh, EarthCube and Geocodes. And it actually, um, it's indexed by Geocodes now in Data Discovery Studio. So if you have that, if you do that correctly, they can read your JSON-LD files, they can index it, and then all of a sudden, more of the world knows about your data set and it can be found more easily. And we keep expanding on this and we, we keep expanding our JSON-LD metadata structure by making it as rich as possible so that people can find your data sets in multiple ways. As I said, you know, you have to provide DOIs to your data sets and different versions of your data sets. Again, it's very important for the FAIR principle. It's the A in there, making it more accessible that way. Again, it's registered, it's uniquely registered as a DOI. And from then on, people can find it always with that unique identifier. And if you assign DOI, you also have to make it permanent. So everything, every data set needs to have a data store behind it that basically guarantees that the data stays there forever. And we have a data store like that, of course, with magic. Um, I already talked about the Fiesta API, but we'll come more about that. But more importantly, there's org IDs there. So we use your org ID credentials to authenticate you before you log into magic and before you upload your data. At the same time, if you actually you have published data with magic, we also actually can attribute that to your ORC ID, and it can actually be seen as an achievement of yours within that ORC ID website. And another thing that's important, we work a lot with publishers. Just for example, we work with Nature, but also with other, you know, Wiley, um, Elsevier. We've worked with all those publishers. And for example, magic in Nature is a recommended repository for rock and paleomagnetic data. So if you publish your data, in nature, they're going to require you to actually upload your data in magic, which is a good thing. Um, and then the I and the R in FAIR are interoperable and reusable. And if you have been part of magic, you know, that's what we started out with 20 years ago. We basically were foreshadowing what needed to get done to make data more interoperable and reusable by making that singular data model and basically forcing the entire community to store all the data in the data model. Now, actually, we can make it more interoperable and we can actually reuse the data much more easily because we always know what the units are in which data is stored, how it was calculated, et cetera, et cetera. And so then finally, at the very end, you know, what's going to be our next steps with magic and mostly thinking about scaling up. I just in the beginning told you that, you know, people are now actually actively really starting to put data into magic. You know, there's an exponential growth happening right here. So of course we are looking really forward to that. Uh, but it also means that in the back end, right, we need to be able to scale up magic to make certain that we can actually deal with all this data you now, including squid data, 3 billion raster data points. So we need to have, be able to actually work with the data and still have a reactive website on the other end when people start searching and filtering the data. So the one thing that we've done that's quite different from maybe 10 years ago or even you know, maybe five or six years ago, we started out with having Magic as a relational database using Oracle. At some point, we stepped away from it. Uh, simply put, you know, it was actually financial a reason for that we couldn't afford the license anymore and so we were forced to step away and we basically 
started to work with Elasticsearch and MongoDB. And actually that has been a golden step for us. Since then, actually, the upscaling of matching has been tremendously easy to do. I'm not going to really, you know, go in all the details of it, but it basically it puts us uh, in a completely different uh, paradigm in actually how you work with data that's complex and that has many aspects to it. But the most important things, it allows you to um, increase the speed of your searches and have much smarter filtering happening. Um, so people can actually really dive into the data set and get what they need out of it. And Elasticsearch and MongoDB and those kind of things are used a lot by other entities online, including online stores to give you a good shopping experience. And so I think we're gaining uh, from that, that approach quite handsomely with magic. And as I said, you know, you can, because of this, the power of Elasticsearch, and the way how that can aggregate your data uh, before you start searching it, it allows us to do some really interesting filtering. And here on the right is something that we're building currently, which is basically an age range filter, not just by giving, you know, a min and a max, but now at the same time showing with it in certain uh, age range, you know, what is the histogram of ages we have in magic? That's the histogram you see here on the right. So actively while you're searching, it will adapt the histogram for you. And you know what kind of data we have in terms of age in the magic database. And you can easily define it and also say, give me anything Cretaceous. If you click Cretaceous here at the bottom, it immediately knows what the upper and the lower boundary is of that geological time scale unit. So really powerful, really helpful for assisting uh, uh, research and education with magic. So I said, we're going to, imp we are proving at the same time on our hardware, as I said, you know, we're scaling up on a number of contributions. We need to scale up in it, in the approaches. We do that with Elasticsearch at the same time. We need to have the hardware to support that. And we just purchased a new Dell PowerEdge server cluster, basically to have a modern CPU set, more memory. It's a clustered node and, you know, just more security there too. But at the same time, we're setting this up uh, as a, what we call a hybrid cloud CIOS AWS infrastructure. So AWS is the Amazon Web Services, and that's basically, that's the cloud. So while we have installing this cluster, we're going to have a direct connection with the AWS Web Services. So all the data actually that are in magic, all the data files behind it are stored in the cloud. And if you do that, you know, it's going to be replicated um, on the many, many data centers of, of Amazon. And basically your data is tremendously safe that way. Um, we're going to be uh, improving many of the details like setting up, you know, uh, our server virtualization platform. It's all behind magic. It allows us to run the Fiesta API. Uh, again, basically all the components that are the engine of magic. It's much easier for us to do it in this modernized uh, setup. So that's important. It was, of course, an, an, an a dollar investment, but one that's quite worthwhile. So a little bit about Fiesta. As I said, we had magic is now powered by this. So what does Fiesta stand for? Well, that stands for the framework for integrated earth science and technology applications. Basically what it is, all the components that we are using in magic can be reused for other applications as well. And so when we are programming magic, everything is compartmentalized in reuse components. And those you can put together in what's called a container. And then actually you can redistribute that in what's called the Docker Kubernetes solution. So you basically take your whole container, puts it somewhere else on another server, and you can use it for another instance of magic, or you can use it for something completely different. Something that would use the same technology, but had, is storing all kinds of other science data. And that's where we're going towards. Because we're also realizing that with magic, you know, we're not only storing paramagnetic data or rock magnetic data, there's this other kind of data that you need to make your magic data more interesting, like age data, or if it's a sediment core, you know, any are, you know, maybe oxygen isotope kind of data to actually compare your um, your magnetic data and susceptibility data that you collect on sediment cores from the ocean, for example. So there's all these other kind of data sets 
that would be valuable to have access to in parallel to your magic data, but it doesn't really exist yet. And we're going to propose that actually we can use this containerized magic style uh, engine that we call Fiesta now for other applications. And so this is how it looks. It's again, it's a bit of a technical box, but it is, it's interesting to look at. So here in the middle, that's the container. It's actually called a Docker as well, as we call it the Fiesta container. And in there is all those services that you know from Magic already. So there's a way, there's user accounts. You know, we work with Oric ID to authenticate you. Um, we have a whole bunch of the files that you uploaded. Those are the static files. There's of course scripts behind it and other functionality for programming. There's your private workspace, the upload tool, there's the search interface. All those things are already in there that's inside that container. And then there is a bunch of configuration files to basically tell you how it should look online, how it should work, how it should communicate with AWS, whatnot. So all that sits in there and that entire thing can be reused for something completely different if you change the data model. So for example, there would be potential data repositories that we can think of that we can build with Fiesta that are of use to Magic. And for example, it could be a Magic-like database on Arc and Arc and Geochronology that could be actually stored in that. Of course, we have to completely make a different data model that's applicable for Arc and data, but we can do that. Uh, same could be for say radiocarbon dating on SpiroFAMS. A lot of people work on them these days. But getting you know the data more the age models for them correctly, having access to the data would be tried to mend it, quite helpful and um, important. Oxygen isotopes in sediment cores, I just ex explained that, or strontium isotope signatures through geological time, all the way back, you know, to the Proterozoic. All these kind of data are of importance when people look at certain aspects of magic and the data residing in it but we don't necessarily have access to this data very easily um, in the same way as we have easy access to, to magic. And so with that, I think that's the end of my talk. And I think I'm ready for questions or we are ready for questions. Thanks, Anthony. Any, uh, any questions? Or Happy to talk about any part of our system or anything that you're uh, interested in uh, about magic. Well, the tradition of the moderator asking the first question is uh, not quite as uh, useful here. Um, <laughs> What is magic exactly? Yeah. Sorry, I ghosted y'all earlier. Uh, my com my internet completely died. Wow. Well, <laughs> well so you, can, you, you can answer that question tell yourself, Lisa. I th think you answered that question. So the question is how what can we on the magic database team do to make things easier, better, simpler, more straightforward for people to put their data? Make yeah, that the number of new contributors in the last year was a real heartening, heartening thing to, um, to see. Yeah, so I think, you know, in a normal, right, magic workshop, right, when we are in person, you know, we, we have a lot of those talks and, you know, we talk a lot in the hallways to people. Um, so we, we don't have a lot of chance to hear from our community, right? When they work with magic, you know, what their experiences are and, um, or if they have any needs that, that we should be aware of. And so this whole squid thing really came about because we have the MIT group, really, you know, producing a lot of these kind of data and actually asking us, you know, how to actually get it into magic. And we had a very good session with them to actually, you know, A, to show them how to do it and that from our end and to actually make it happen. And there might be other data sets where, you know, 
uh, they might not easily go into magic or they are not traditionally going into magic, but should be in magic. And I think that would be very nice to hear about too. Uh, relatedly, I have a, a question and I'm asking for a friend here, joke. No, but if you've already submitted data to a repository and it has a DOI attached to it, is it possible to also duplicate that data set and upload it to magic? Is that kosher or is a DOI um, binding in some way? People, people are doing that. This is a sort of a, uh, an issue in the data community right now. Um, and it's not been uh, very well decided on how to have what is the, you know, source of the data, the original source that uh, other people should say is the uh, uh, authentic, uh, where you should trace back to. Um, and so it's fine to put it in magic and you can get a DOI uh, and you can reference uh, the other data set and we can label that, you know, people label it in our schema.org JSON LD header, uh, the, the same as is sort of what people use. And so they say, this is the same as this other data set, um, but there's not a, this is the best, this is the uh, primary source. So, um, you know, it, it would be great to get the data in magic. It makes it a lot easier to search and so on. Um, and uh, maybe uh, adding a link out uh, to that on the contribution page would be a good idea for something uh, for us to add. Okay. I could add to that. I think one of the things that's interesting about your question is the idea that if you, I mean, in many cases, people are submitting data or supplementary information for articles and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, there's some value added in data in conforming to a new, a different kind of data model. And, uh, you know, so I think the, the question you're asking is, is this double dipping, right? And uh, I think that putting things in different formats and making sure that they are, I mean, in principle, it, if, if it was exactly the same, it, it could be resolved by an API that can go to the other database and grab it and you get it back. But if you're making some difference in the in the format and the ability to use it, then I think it's a perfectly legitimate use. And in fact, something as Nick says, we should re really be encouraging that because it's making it um, more interoperable and reusable. Okay. And so one one thing that is oh, can I? Okay, you want to go first? Well, I just want to to say that. Quite often when people are uploading data that has been already you know stored somewhere else when they get into magic they start actually supplementing it with extra data like the measurement level data that might not be in the other one right so that's that stage it becomes different by definition already and then you should have another uh, doi associated to it so lisa go ahead well i was just going to say that it's very unlikely that whatever you stored wherever you stored it, it will be exactly the same because um, our data model is very specific. And if you put it on, say, Zenodo as a Word document, it's not going to be the same data set. But it will have the same data in it. No, that's very true, Lisa. And uh, one can also make it more comprehensive. So if you stored rock magnetic data or anisotropy data, you could add the paleo mag to it and have one nice package mm -hmm. of magic. And that's a really good idea. Yeah, yeah. and we're you guys at IRM to be able to just export your your data from the IRM database, which is itself a database, into the magic format and then up into magic. And it's not like plagiarism. Somehow data are not the same as words. <laughs> so I think ethically it's okay. Right, Kathy, you're the ethicist. <laughs> uh, I think I'm, I'm just trying to say here that people are still trying to, as Nick said, people are still trying to find their way through the idea of what publishing data is all about, because that's effectively what you're doing here. You're publishing data. And in publishing in peer reviewed journals with research and analysis, we have this idea that it has to be original. But I, and uh, you know, it may be that there are going to be some standards that will evolve here, but uh, probably right now we're, we're in the process of setting those standards. And I think we want to make them so that they serve the community. 
And I guess for, for clarity to this discussion too, the uh, magic is still set up such that contributions are associated with pub publications so mm -hmm. and are made public at the time of, of publication. So this means there is sort of an inherent link between that, that publication and the data. Um, it's useful too, because you can link, you can use the publication DOI as a way to quick link to a contribution. Um, that's the way that I've been doing it in papers is you pop in the, uh, the magic database URL with the publication URL after afterwards, which gets you to it. Um, and I guess I, I said this in my talk, but just to sort of reiterate that we can be getting, you can get contributions into magic and this came through in Anthony's talk too, but then I can be sharing them at the time of review. Um, and I will say, we just need to continue. There are these policies now that are, uh, you know, at AGU journals, for example, that this needs to um, happen. I still think as a community, we're working towards all reckoning with that so that every time we do get a paper to review that it, um, or submit one ourselves that we've uh, achieved these standards that our scientific societies are, are, set, are setting for us all. And we, we really encourage people to reach out to us before you're, you've submitted a paper or you know, far ahead in the process. And, and ideally, and what we should work towards is in your workflow while you're doing the research, um, your data is being stored in such a format that uh, it can be uh, put into magic in a relatively easy way. So um, we help people set up these workflows uh, and many labs already um, you know, are, are working this way and uh, that's, that's sort of the best way to go as opposed to, oh, I put, I put my paper, I submitted it, uh, decided that magic would be the repository and now we've got to rush and get it up there. So um, we will help you on short notice, but uh, it's much better to try to do it earlier. Mm -hmm. There's another question that, that um, is brought up by Dario's question. And that is, um, what happens, I mean, there's several different kinds of papers. Uh, you could present your own research and your own data, and then that's a kind of self-contained thing. Or you can do like, like many people do, which is to combine your results with the broader context of results. Like we saw all the poll positions or or, um, or, you know, compilations of intensity data through these kinds of things throughout this, this session, this, this workshop. So when you use someone else's data, but you change something about it, or you change an interpretation or an age, or you update it, or you recombine it, then in magic, you can, put in the DOI of the original publication, but include those data that you used in your paper to make your own um, conclusions um, uh, as a second DOI. And so you get the original publication, but you also get your enhancement to it. And this is, uh, it, it, you can imagine that it'll get kind of difficult at some point, but at least the original producer of the data gets credit that way uh, for uh, instead of just, you know, one of these databases like Pint or, or Geomagia or something um, where the tendency is for people to uh, refer to the compilation of the data and not the original sources. And so I think we as a community need to work on this concept and, I, and it's not it's not obvious what's the best way to do it um, but I, I think that we can do it better through magic and so that everybody you know you know where the data come from <laughs> the original paper um, and that person gets credit for